school may be out for the summer, but the time is always right for a novel that teaches tolerance and understanding through laughter. This is Chapter 2 of Author Talks with Lisa T. And coming up, author team Ali Frank and Asha Yeomans chat with me about their latest rom-com featuring a woman in the second half, dare we say, better half of her life. So this is your third collaboration. Once again, you guys don't shy away from some topics that a lot of people can't bring themselves to talk about for for even a like 30 seconds, but you manage to fill a whole book with these things. It's we have Nina Morgan Clark. She's a 40 something black woman who has everything going for her when a not so little surprise threatens to derail her. But this is your story. So I'm going to let you guys tell my listeners what they can expect when they pick up the better half. Who wants I'll to go first? Up, well, I think that you will pick up a story that um, starts off seeming like our, our character has it all in life and that she's arrived at the pinnacle of her life. Um, but she's 43 and there's a whole nother lifetime ahead of her. And she doesn't realize yet or have um, appreciation yet for the fact that some of the best things may be to come in that second half of her life. She is a planner and she has planned for things to happen wonderfully up to this point. But as we all know, as soon as you make that plan, uh, the universe loves to tear it down and um, it may be for the better. So we're hoping that uh, readers find um, hope and inspiration that the second half of life can be the better half of life. And maybe laugh a little bit with Nina along the oh way. Oh my gosh, laugh a lot. I mean, Nina and her best friend Marisol, who is um, on this adventure uh, with her every step of the way, as so many of us are lucky to have a good friend um, that is like that. Uh, they're, they're two women who I know Allie and I would definitely hang out with. I was going to say uh, or ask, is is the relationship between between you two anything like the relationship between Nina and Marisol? Well, I you know, it's funny because it's always asked with every book how much of it um, is a big dump or a small dump from your own relationships or your own being. And I don't know necessarily that Nina and Marisol are Asha and I, other than when you write together and you work together, you get really good at being truth tellers to one another, for sure. But I think that there's a theme that's thread throughout the book that um, is very representative of Asha and I, and that is the idea that the second half of your life and holding on too tightly to expectations will, you know, first rattle you and kind of not blow up necessarily poorly in your face. If anyone had asked Asha and I 10 years ago, when we were working together in a school, oh, do you think in 10 years time, you would, you'll be on your now writing your fourth manuscript on humorous books about race, religion, parenting, children, schools. I mean, Asha, would you have ever guessed this is where we'd be? Oh, no. I still think it's like, uh, like is, is this really my life now? And then I have to call Allie and check in and she'll remind me, yes, you have a deadline. Get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> but so, this, you know, this idea that nothing is really predictable, regardless of like how much you're smoothing out your path, that no journey is really ever finished even when you think you've crossed the finish line and that change. So many of us are rattled by change and change is unnerving, but it's really more the anticipation of change that it's unnerving. The actual change can be life altering in all the best ways. And we think that's what happened with Nina. And for Asha and I, career wise, that's definitely what happened for us. I find it to be equal parts terrifying, but also hopeful in that, you know, this is not the end for anybody out there who's listening. There's there, there always can be, and I will throw another literary metaphor out there, a next chapter in, in what you're going to do. I want to talk about, though, I have here my my not so official list 
of all the the difficult subjects you guys managed to tackle in this particular book, we have abortion, interracial relationships, mixed babies, raising black sons, divorce, societal expectations of women, losing one's cultural identity. Is there anything on that on there that I missed? Because it's just and, and yet you managed to write this book that is laugh out loud funny. That's really, you know, it it also is teaching us a lesson, but we don't feel like we're being schooled. And maybe that's because you guys were educators first, because you present these life lessons in such a way that we don't even realize you're trying to you, you've created a teaching moment. I think that does partially come from our background as educators. Um, in large part, we are teaching empathy to kids when they come into our care in schools. We read fiction stories to them, humorous stories to them. We invite them to put themselves in the shoes of characters um, that they hear out loud from the very beginning of school in the grade that I taught, which is pre-K, all the way up until the grades that Allie taught in high school. Um, Using fiction is a wonderful way to teach empathy. And these difficult topics can be handled heart first. And that's what we're trying to do with our writing. Um, it's very, very difficult to be mad or be in a contentious discussion with someone with whom you're laughing. And if you start off with a smile on your face, connection and conversation can be that much easier. And that's really been the goal, or I would say the mission of Asha and my writing is that we wanted to take on these challenging topics, but we wanted to do it with joy and with humor and with laughter. And for people to see that those emotions are as much as an entry into difficult topics as reading or watching, if you're more prone to TV and film, um, the trauma and the drama of these different topics that you can learn through laughter, you can learn through tears, you can learn through joy, and you can learn through pain. And it's all equal in having an open and curious mind. Learning through pain is not any greater of an experience than learning through joy. And that's really the mission of our, uh, of our writing and I would also just add, when you were, I was listening to that list, I'm like, yep, yep. We're, it's almost like hit the big 10. <laughs> but one of our big um, themes that we were super interested in exploring within the race context was um, Zora Neale Hurston's quote of not all skin folk or kin folk, because there's also often this assumption if Asha speaks, she's speaking on behalf of all Black people. If Ali speaks, she's speaking on behalf of all Jewish people. For those that are in a minority group, this idea of it all, all those people fit into a tidy package. And that is a notion that we really push um, in this book. And for me, at least, was one of the most fun um banters and dialogues and storylines to grow. Have you heard from readers? Do they understand what you're trying to do? I, I think they do. We've With our very first book, Tiny Imperfections, we also um, explored privilege and race and um, expect life expectations. And one of the most memorable reviews for me was one that uh, from a reader who said, wow, I laughed so often in this book, but sometimes I wasn't sure if I was supposed to. Mm. Um, if you're laughing, you're supposed to. It, it, it's, it's giving you something, an opportunity to learn, a pause to listen, a moment to reflect. Laughter has is very powerful. Um, besides causing fewer wrinkles on your face than frowning, uh, <laughs> laughter is it, it's such... It encapsulates such uh, the ability to teach. Ali reminds me often of the phenomenon of uh, will and grace and what that did for the LGBTQ plus community, um, inviting us into a human story, human relationships, 
that caused us to laugh and learn at the same time. It's, it, it, it's a, it's a powerful force. I love to the setting, your private school setting, because I think, you know, I, I, I know this is a, a setting that you, that you've revisited, but it just, it seems to be there's such rich fodder there for so many stories and so many instances where, where you would just think to yourself, this can't really happen, can it? <laughs> like in the whole application process, like it just, it blows my mind every time you throw in like a little detail, which I'm sure is drawn from some life experience somewhere, some real life example. It's just mind blowing every time. And it frankly, really entertaining. <laughs> Well, we'll say for our, if any of our readers are listening, this was like the third of our trifecta about schools. Our fourth (laughs) book that is coming in a year, year and a half is completely, completely different. We definitely don't want to be one trick ponies. Um, But the beauty of a school setting is that the products ultimately are humans And schools are multi-generational facilities. And there are, you know, maybe other than religious organizations, I don't know any other companies or organizations for whom the, you know, outcome of the product is a human being a good person in the world. And there's oh so many people with opinions on exactly how to do that. And so it is rich fodder. And Asha and I often say, you know, being an educator, you are the ultimate ultimate observer of humanity. And yes, there are, we have a ton of stories, but all our stories and reflections just come from being in the presence of, you know, from four-year-olds to 18-year-olds to parents, to grandparents, to your colleagues. Um, you know, it's, it's a study in humankind and we've got over 40 years of it. I just outed our age, by the way. (laughs) That's okay. I earned these gray hairs. (laughs) We'll keep it between us gals. (laughs) I spoke with you guys when, when your debut came out and I'm wondering how has your relationship between the two of you as, as writing partners and also as friends changed as you guys have become so successful oh my god I love that you think we've become so (laughs) successful that sounds good I'm gonna tell my husband that one (laughs) (laughs) oh gosh I I would say the uh, the biggest gift for me um in the past five years has been um becoming another member of Allie's family I have a whole nother group of in-laws and you know her husband-in-law and her two girls are like nieces to me um you become very intimate I spend the night at her house they see me in my pajamas I'm cooking eggs I'm sneaking treats to her dog um without her permission um (laughs) and my children it's like gaining a, a new family in a way that colleagues in other jobs might not have an opportunity to do, but we have to work together so closely on every comma that we put on a page on uh, agreeing to the spelling of a particular character's name. Is it Dwayne with a W or Dwayne with a U? Cause one of them really drives me crazy. We can't spell it that way. <laughs> um, or more my favorite on that name is like, what's the black way to spell Dwayne versus the white way to spell Dwayne? <laughs> There's two That's types different. of Dwaynes. Um, I, I think that's been the 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 greatest part of our journey over over these five years for me. And for you, well, Ellen? I would say the part that hasn't changed. Um, but maybe we have more patience for is, um, but, you know, personalities are personalities is I'm the definite worry wart and the stressor of us too. And I recognize that with, with each book we write, I stress and agonize over the exact same things each time. And each time I say to Asha, 
no, I know that I know I felt like this way before, but this is totally different this time. Like, this is really it. I don't think we can do it. I hate this story, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Asha has great patience with my worry and we get through it and we get to the other side, but at the beginning of our journey, I was fearful of sharing these hard emotions with Asha. Um, and now I just call her in the middle of the night. I still have them, but I have no boundaries. <laughs> Our boundaries w- when we're in person and when we're on FaceTime, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I think? It, maybe I would like to make the argument that a, a really good friendship, which I think you guys probably, as as much as you have a working relationship, you're friends, that having no boundaries means that there's maybe less misunderstandings. And if we all were to maybe speak a little bit more or ask those questions that we're embarrassed to ask because we're not sure how the other person's going to react, maybe the world would be a little bit better. Maybe we'd all be a little bit kinder to each other. And that's what I love about what I love about your books, because, you know, as a white woman who grew up in New York City, there are a lot of things I don't know. And I'm glad your books kind of allow me to ask someone, hey, I don't mean to insult you, but I kind of want to know. I read this in this book. Is this is actually the way it is? And I don't know if that's what you intend. But for me, I love that it's it's an opportunity to open a conversation that you maybe wouldn't have had because you were a little bit embarrassed by it. <laughs> oh, I agree. I love your technique, Lisa. I mean, uh, our goal is not for everyone to be colorblind. I want you to appreciate this tan I have. <laughs> um, but we do want to uh, encourage people to find their inner teacher and remember their inner student. So as a child, I mean, you're so curious. You want to know everything. And when I taught little kids, they had no problem asking me, Teacher Asha, why is your bottom so big? (laughs) Teacher Asha, why does your hair look like that today? Did you brush it? Uh, Teacher Asha, did you drink coffee this morning? Because your breath smells kind of funny. They have no boundaries. And I still loved them after questions that an adult would have been, you know, and completely embarrassed to ask, you know, absolutely stop themselves from asking. Now, I'm not saying you go out there and ask every passerby <laughs> if you can touch their hair. If it's a black woman, she is not going to say yes. But I do encourage people to seek out relationships with people who are different than themselves, because it is an amazing thing to keep learning in your life. And learning about other people is a great way to Um, open up your eyes to the greater world as well. Well, and one thing that we do say over and over and more often to white women that than to anyone else is, um, you know, we are at this unfortunate place in our culture where if someone misspeaks or misasks something, they're quickly, you know, the hand is slapped and they feel like, oh, I'm going to completely retreat. I can't reach out anymore. I can't ask anymore. And Ashin and I say all the time, if someone reacts negatively or if they don't want to invest or they don't want to be your fountain of knowledge, fine. And that's on them. That's not on you. So just move along and stay curious and stay asking and stay open and stay accepting because other people out there won't. But just because one person might turn their shoulder for whatever reason doesn't mean you should stop. But we're very much in this place of I got my feelings hurt because someone didn't respond correctly. So now I'm not going to reach out again. No, 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 no. That was that person. Go on to another one. So we do really want to keep encouraging people to be curious and ask um, and conversate from a place of best intention. See, you're teaching us again. Teach us in the book, teach us in the interviews. Oh, well. (laughs) This is why I love you guys. Both of us are children of teachers as well. So uh, (laughs) this is 
<laughs> kind of how we were brought up and we're used to it. Um, we're hoping <laughs> everyone else joins. Also parents, I just want to say, true. because I do say this a lot to some of my friends that, sorry, we're tangenting for a minute, but c- people can become such an over explainer, particularly white parents, over explainer to their kids. I'm like, not everything is a teachable moment. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. It's a no or a yes, and you move on. I think that is life advice. (laughs) So you did mention you're going to move away from schools in your next book. Can you give us a little hint as to where we're going to find you two come next summer? Yes, if all goes well. Um, Allie should be receiving the um, my last portion of the manuscript in the mail today. Okay. And um, if our editor gives it a thumbs up, um, our next book will take place in another arena where you will see a, an amazing cross-section of humanity. And that is um, in an airport. Oh, uh, I can only imagine... Allie and- Oh my gosh, Allie and I are both uh, people watchers. We love to sort of, you know, just watch what people do what and think about what what is compelling them. How did she choose to wear that furry pink jacket to the airplane today? <laughs> Why is that man alone and he has five children? Does he have to fly? <laughs> um, so the airport is is the next milieu for our book. But still looking at the same, because there's a lot of different ways to look at the topics of race and religion. And um, this book is really about perseverance in the face of absolute challenge, challenge that's come from a personal experience, but challenge that has been set up by society as well. And um we really explore a deep intergenerational friendship as well. So most of our, you know, tight relationships with friends have always been, um, you know, similar age, but now we're exploring friendships that vast, much different ages. I love that. As having friends who are a different generation of me, I love I, when you can put that on the page, because some people just don't understand it. They're like, how are you friends with someone who, lived a completely different life than you. It's like, it doesn't matter. The age doesn't matter. You connect on a, a different level. So I'm, I'll be excited to read that. In the meantime, nope. people can pick up The Better Half. Ali Frank, Asha Humans, thank you so much for your time today. I wish you, you know, the best of luck. In, your, in my eyes, you are successful. You are a <laughs> successful writing duo. We'll take it. <laughs> and we hope everyone, everyone laughs. We really hope everyone laughs and feels love. And that's where we close the book on this chapter. I don't know about you, but I totally want to grab a glass of wine and be friends with those two. Next time, I highlight one of my favorite genres, historical fiction, with author Madeline Martin, who'll share why she had to rewrite her entire story after finishing it. I found this incredible detail, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is a story that I have to write. So I stopped... I threw out the entire book and I started from scratch. (laughs) If you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, it's not too late. Seriously, it's not too late. Head on over to lisatbooks.com and sign up for our newsletter and you'll never miss an episode. But if you find yourself yearning for more content in between episodes, make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram at lisatbooks. I'm Lisa T. Keep turning those pages.